Yeah, so uh, this, is a, this is becoming a pretty big field. And what I'm going to do is try to give you some ideas in the, in the, most, in the least general setting, which is about knots in S3. And then later on, maybe generalize it for, for, for bigger ones. So I'm going to define um, knot flare homology for, for knots in S3. And this is done by using grid diagrams. So a grid diagram is an n by n uh, uh, grid with the property that every column and every row contains one x and one o. And then from a grid diagram, you can construct uh, a knot in the following way, that first you connect uh, every x to an o horizontally. And then underneath this, you connect every o to an x in the vertic vertical lines. And uh, you make sure that, that the horizontal is the one which is overcrosses the vertical one. And then this gives you a, a knot, or some, in some cases, a link in R3. Uh, just it's, it's the projection of it. You can smooth it out a little bit if you feel like. Um, I'm going to assume, just for simplicity, that everything is a knot. And then there are moves which I'm going to call grid moves, which don't change the knot, uh, but change the grid. And one of them is a cyclic permutation. So if you, have a, if you have a grid diagram, then you can just move the left-hand side, left side column to the right-hand side, uh, or vice versa, and you can do the same with the rows. And uh, you can... Um, you can, if you have two columns or rows whose O's and X's are, are nested, meaning that, that they are not like this, but one of them is inside the other, or they are like this, then you can interchange those two, two columns or rows. Uh, this operation is called commutation. And then there is another operation which increases the size of the, of the grid that's called stabilization. So you choose a, you choose a a point where, where there, there is a, a marking, or an, an X or an O, and then you introduce two ex, one extra column and one extra row, and uh, change the markings just in, in, the, in the place where, where, where the original marking used to be. So here, I uh, put X's and O's everywhere except to the upper left corner of the, of, of the, of the grid. And then, then this gives me four different ways, ways to do this. And depending on whether I do it in, with an O and an X, this gives me eight different day, day ways to do stabilization. And I can also do this stabilization. And you can just simply check it by a little bit of case analysis that these uh, operations don't change the knot. So the first one doesn't change the knot because, because everything you move is, is entirely over the knot. Uh, the next one is, in worst case, a Rydemeister to move. Usually, sometimes it's just an isotopy of the, of the knot. And uh, the third one could introduce uh, an extra kink, a Rydemeister one move, or do an isotopy. Why yeah? did you use at least two different kind of knots? Because it get crosses everywhere when two columns could be used. Oh, so this gives me an orientation for my, for my knot. Because because I, I'm going from the from X to O on the horizontal lines. So when you go from X to O, it, that's the over one. That, that's the one that goes over. Or how, how do I know which one goes over and which one goes? The over? horizontal goes over. Oh, the horizontal always goes over. Yes. <coughs> but is it? Can you put crosses everywhere uh, around that is incompatible that way? Because the other one is over somewhere. No no no. You 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 could put just two two X's. And I think actually in, in my my interpretation, it's not going to matter. But there is a, there is another another uh, uh, like a more general settings for this where where it, it would would make a big difference. So. Uh, and uh, so what what I wanted to say one more that not only did these, these grid moves give you isotopic knots but these are the only moves which give you isotopic knots in the following sense that if you have two grid diagrams that gives you isotopic knots then they are related by a sequence of the above three operations or their inverses. 
and then, and then, so have, having this result, one can define a, a, any theory uh, with the following strategy that you define define a theory uh, for a, for any grid diagram, and then you prove that it's invariant under these grid moves I showed you. Uh, and then what I'm going to define is not Fuller homology. Um, and it's easier to think of it if you identify the left and the right hand side and the upper and the bottom side so that to put it in a tor on a torus. And then the, if it's an n by n grid, then the generators are going to be n tuples of intersection points between the, the horizontal and the vertical lines so that uh, on, on each uh, horizontal line there is exactly one and on each vertical line you have exactly one. So in this case you have n minus one factorial um, elements, uh, generators, and um, oh no, sorry, and n, okay, n factor ele elements, elements in this group, and I'm thinking about all of these things over z two, just because I'm I'm don't want to care about orientations. Uh, and then the differential, so to make it a chain complex, I, I, I would introduce a differential in it. It's uh, given by empty rectangles. Uh, and so if you have empty rectangles go between, between elements that, that differ in exactly two coordinates. So if you have two elements, do you see the, the light blue and the light green elements on the, on the board? So if you have those two elements, they differ in exactly two, two coordinates and then, then they, they, they span uh, four rectangles. One of them is the one I drawn. There is this one, this one, and this one. And then, and then two of two of these four rectangles were going in the way that that uh, the <coughs> lower left corner and the upper right corner were blue, and there were others for which this wasn't true. And the ones who, uh, whose lower left corner and upper right corners are blue, I say that this is a rectangle going from from the blue to the green. Uh, and then I call a rectangle empty if it's empty, if it contains no x and no o and no other uh, <laughs> generator point in its interior. And then the definition of the, of, the, of the differential is just simply count all elements to which you have, a, you have a, an empty rectangle too. So for example, to this green element, there is one rectangle you can find which is empty. It gives you that the boundary of the of the blue is, is, is green, and then uh, there is another one you can find. Uh, so it's the sum of those, and if you look at the picture a little bit more, then I hope I didn't screw up and there is no more uh, differential element here. So that's basically the element. And then this gives me a homology. That's a statement already. This means that, uh, that the boundary square is zero, and, uh, and then you, you can define two gridings on it com in completely combinatorial terms uh, and, uh, and with respect to these two gridings, the homology is going to be a categorification of the Alexander polynomial in, in the sense that, in, in, in that sense that the Alexander polynomial is, is given as the Euler characteristic with respect to the one of the gridings. I do work mod two, yes. Uh, yeah, I could work mod Z. It would be just a little bit more complicated, uh, much more complicated. Uh, and then, and then, uh, oh, which I forgot to tell you that this is an invariant. Uh, almost, it's not quite invariant under under um, uh, stabilization of the grid, so it depends on the size of the grid. But you can find an invariant in the whole thing, uh, so it is going to be something tensored with a, with a two-dimensional graded uh, uh, vector space. Uh, and then, so I'll Alexander polynomial gave an upper bond on the, on the genus of the knot. This categorification gives you the genus. So you can compute the genus just by computing this, this uh, Hegar homology. Also, you can figure out whether or not it's fibered or not. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is that it gives you an effective invariance for Legendrian and transverse knots. By effective, I mean that 
you can use it to distinguish Legendrian and transverse knots. Uh, so, uh, a Legendrian knot is a knot whose projection in the x y plane determines the knot by the equation that the third coordinate, okay, so this is, this should be a y there. The third coordinate y is dz over dx. Uh, <laughs> so if you, if you have, have, have this projection, then, then you can just figure out how, how high to, you should lift up, lift up the, the, the third coordinate just by, by the slope of, of the projection. And then uh, this means that, that every crossing is determined. Uh, whenever you see a crossing, you always know that, that the one with the, with the upper strand goes over, over the, the one with, with the bigger strand. And, uh, and uh, you, you cannot have a, any vertical tangency because that would mean uh, infinite third coordinate. So instead of vertical tangencies, you're going to have those kind of cusps, which you see in the, in the other picture. And if you remembered, because o we always wanted the horizontal lines to go over the vertical lines, we, we had this, uh, we, we or already had, had, some, had some special structure on, on, on the grids. So whenever you have a grid diagram, it, it naturally gives you a uh, Legendrian knot. You just rotate the whole picture by, by 45 degrees and smooth out the upper left and the lower right corners. Um, and then if you, if you are thinking about Legendrian knots, then you only want to consider isotopies of knots which go through other Legendrian knots. And uh, this, is a, this gives you a restricted set of, of uh, isotopies and it can be completely understood in terms of grid moves. You just use uh, 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 the restricted set of grid moves. And what Oshbet Subwent Sirstern proved that this gives you that you can define an invariant as the upper right corners of the axis uh, for, for Legendrian knots. And that's going to be invariant under these grid moves. And then I wanted to generalize all of this to, to arbitrary three manifolds. And then, so the whole picture, I told you, it's, it sits on a torus. A torus, if you embed it in the three space, it gives you a Hegar decomposition of your three dimensional manifold. And then the horizontal curves, which were red on my previous pictures, are going to be curves which bond disks on, on, in, in one of the, one of the Hegar, decom uh, Hegar the mm, handlebodies. And uh, it's, uh, the, the blue curves are going to be curves which bond in the other, other handlebody. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm choosing an arbitrary Hegar decomposition, and I'm choosing curves which bond in one or, or in the other. And then, uh, and then uh, the x intersection is going to be an intersection of the knot with, with, the, with the original surface, with the Hegar surface, which is positive, and the o's are going to be negative intersections of the knot and the Hegar surface. And then the generators are going to be antiples of intersections of these red and blue curves, so, such that you have one on each. And the boundary maps use to count rectangles, and that's going to be very more complicated. You are going to com compute holomorphic cur counts holomorphic curves with specified boundary conditions in a, in a surface across the disk, uh, of course, with a given, given contact, com complex structure. Uh, and then, um, and then uh, what you can prove that this homology gives you an invariant of the Legendrian knot. And then uh, you can also generalize Legendrian knots in, in for an arbitrary three manifold. I mean, that's not the generalization, that's basically the original definition. A contact structure is a, is a plane field uh, in your three manifold, and the Legendrian knot is something which is, which is tangent to this plane field at every point. This gives you back the original definition for S3. And uh, Lee Skolzsvach, Tipschitz, and Sabo defined invariants for, 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 for Legendrian knots in, in the general case. And uh, what I've been doing so far is uh, uh, using these invariant, I, I constructed infinitely many transverse knots. And then so far, I only spoke about two Legendrian invariants, but there is a third one, which is also defined in this Hegard first settings. Uh, we gave a map which brings the third one to the to the to the general one, and that proves that if you have that under certain conditions, the Legendrian invariant vanishes. Also, 
uh, we recently proved that this grid invariant is the same as the as the other invariant in, in the standard contact structure. And using k for invariants, we could give a complete classification of twist knots. In, these are the twist knots. And I want to do other things too. Thank you. <laughs>